Thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right, let's come to the Lord now in prayer and just ask him to prepare our hearts as we come and worship him. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for uh, who you are and what you're doing in our individual lives and in the lives of our congregation. We praise you, Lord. And this morning as we are here, we are thankful that we have opportunity to renew our minds and test and approve that your will is good, perfect, and pleasing. Lord, so we do pray that you will bless this moment as we come to worship you. You call us to be a church that will know you and make you known, so we do pray that in these moments we will have this opportunity to get to know you in a more intimate way and having encounter with you that will change us in such a way that when we leave this place, we will be Christ-like and make you known to others. That's our desire and our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, please stand as we sing the new hallelujah. Can you hear? There's a new song breaking out from the children of freedom. Every race and every nation. Sing it out, sing a new hallelujah.
about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. As we continue to lift up our Lord and Savior and thank him for the victory that he's given, uh, given us and the victory he's had over death, uh, we just continue to lift him up in the power of his great love.
frame says, <coughs> says draw, <coughs> says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up and you will soar like an eagle. We'll continue to worship the Lord with financial gifts and also having opportunity to write down all our praises that you would like to praise the Lord for or write any prayer requests that you would like for us to bring to the Lord, any needs that you have on the care card, and then at the end of the service, just put it in a box, and we're going to bring this to the Lord, come near to Him, and rejoice in the promise that He said He will come near to us and lift us up in the time of need. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing upon this part of the service. Thank you for this day. Thank you for Trina, and Alice and the baby they are having a day. And thank you for everybody being safe here. And thank you for uh, everybody listening to the teachers. And thank you for um, um, and for the prayer we got for this today. And amen. 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 Please be seated. The song I'm doing this morning is about 20 years old now. It's by Bebo Norman, and I was fortunate enough to see Bebo when he was touring for his first uh, official album. And when you're a musician, a singer, songwriter, going off and doing touring and getting involved with the record label and leaving your home behind and doing all that kind of stuff is kind of scary. It's uh, going into the unknown. And I kind of feel like we as a church have been kind of searching for a while, literally and spiritually. And this song was something that he wrote to give himself encouragement. So you can almost think of this as the word of encouragement when you're feeling a little uncertain about what's coming ahead. So I hope uh, it's a, as much a blessing to you as it has been for me for the past 20 years. Can y'all hear that? Yeah. All right. I'll need to pack that away for later. It's a better place standing high upon this mountain. I've seen your face full of the light that only this height can show. A blistered hand is what you've given, but you've been given all you'll ever need to know. So walk down this mountain with your heart. Follow in the footsteps of your maker And with his love that's gone before you And these people at your side If you offer up your broken cup You will taste the meaning of this life yeah. It's a common ground that I see we're all still standing. Just look around and you will find the very face of God. He's walking down into the distance. He's going down to where the masses 
Follow in the footsteps of your maker. And with this love that's gone for you and these people at your side, if you offer up your broken cup, you'll taste the meaning of this life. This life. Standing in a place. This is how the world should be. How the world should be. Thank you, Brother Steve. Children are now dismissed to their classes. Rebecca will be here on the right and take you to your classes. Any children that would like to go to children's church, just follow Miss Rebecca. Praise the Lord. All right. Amen. Pastor Bobby will come and share God's word with us. Good to see you this morning. Appreciate your coming out to worship with us today. Chosen a title for our message this morning, Fulfill My Joy. Philippians chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 4. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Paul writes, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Join me as we pray. Lord, in these moments as we study from your word, would you impress on our hearts how we might fulfill your joy, how our lives can be used for the kingdom of God. Speak to us and encourage us, Lord, that we might walk faithfully. And Lord, if any of us are struggling with issues in our life, may we come to this time of invitation at the end of this service and just surrender ourselves to you, allowing your spirit to move in our hearts to draw us close to you again. Lord, bind up Satan that he cannot interfere, and we'll thank you and praise you for how you work in this place. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we begin chapter 2 of our study in Philippians, Paul emphasizes his understanding of church. He has in mind a fellowship of believers. Uh, somebody described the word fellowship as putting two fellows in one ship. Small boat. 
You better learn to get along. In the church family, we need to learn to get along. We need to not always agree about everything, but we need to work together so that we can go. Uh, I've been in a boat, a fishing boat with my dad. And I was paddling one direction and dad was paddling the other. I've been in the boat when dad wasn't paddling. He was just fishing and I was paddling and we just went round and round in circles. It takes us working together as a team for us to move the church forward as God would have it go. Paul has in mind a fellowship of believers who do life together. We experience life individually. But as the family of God, we need to experience life together. We'll talk about that a little more as we go along. Uh, That fellowship of believers learns to love each other, to help and encourage each other, and all of us seek to do God's will. Paul describes it in this passage to say there is no room for selfishness, conceit, or pride. Those within the church family do not seek honor for themselves, but work to build others up and serve one another. So let's see what Paul says. First of all, unity, not uniformity. At the beginning of verse 2, Paul says, Fulfill my joy by thinking the same way. Now how in the world do we get this larger group of folks to think the same way? Well, you bring in an interim pastor who makes them want a new pastor that much better and we all start thinking the same way. I got it. I understand that. That's that's a good thing. Paul is not really referring to uniformity. Uh, If you're in a business that requires you to wear a uniform, you understand the terminology uniformity. Whether you like that outfit or not, you wear that outfit. It might not be the kind of fashion you would normally wear, but the boss had said you either wear it or you don't work here at this place. Yes, sir, I'll go ahead and wear it, even though I don't like it. It's not my style, it's not my color, it's not what I want, but I do need a job, and so I'll wear what you tell me to wear. That's uniformity. We're we're all forced to do the same thing. Paul does not have that in mind for the church. Now, we do not practice uniformity, but we do want to work for unity. Uh, We cannot force you to think and act like everybody else. There's no way we could do that. But we do hope that when our standard is based on the Word of God, we can all agree that we need to live like God teaches us in His Word. It's not forced on us. We choose that. We select how we're going to live and our guide for life needs to be the Word of God. And so we base what we do, how we act on what God teaches us from His Word. Our hope is that we will be in unity, that we will agree together and work together about the basic doctrines, about our purpose as a church, and we work to try to live in harmony to the best that we can. Unity is an internal decision that says sometimes I will lay aside my desires to do what you want. Sometimes you lay aside your desires to do what the larger body of believers wants. Uh, I guarantee you if you stay in church very long, the church will make a decision somewhere along the line you don't agree with. But that's okay. I've made decisions I didn't agree with after I thought about it a while. And so we all will have these times when we don't exactly see, but we will support the body of Christ. We will support what the majority has decided. Paul mentions four things that will help us in showing unity in this passage of Scripture. The first one he mentions is encouragement in Christ. Every person that we see In this room, in Sunday school, in the next service, everyone is important to God. And sometimes you go to a meeting and you feel like you don't fit in, you don't belong. 
I've been to a number of those over the years. I was there because I was asked to go, but when I got there, I thought, man, I really don't need to be here. This is not my place. Listen, that should never be your feeling at church. You may not be quite the same as everybody else, but you ought to feel like this is my church. This is where I belong. I will invest my life and my time here. God does not want anybody to be lost. And sometimes we don't quite understand the term lost. I know where I'm at. I'm, I'm at Kenley Missionary Baptist Church. But the term lost refers to being apart from God. God does not want you to be apart from Him, away from Him. He wants you to be close to Him. Our role as a church family is to encourage each other. We all need encouragement. We all need help at times in our life. Even those who may choose a lifestyle that we don't quite agree with, they, they still need our love and our encouragement. And we work to try to help them come to find the way of Christ. We're not to be highly critical of one another, condemning one another. That will certainly not draw them to the Lord. The second thing that he mentions in this section is a consolation of love. And I'm going to do more about love in the second point, so I won't say but just a couple of words here. We are to be a loving and caring fellowship of believers. How do we want our church known in this community? I hope it will be known as a place where you can go and find love, find people that care about you. That ought to be our reputation as a church. The third thought he mentions is fellowship in the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in our lives if we are believers in Jesus Christ. God gives His Spirit kind of as a down payment to us of what it's going to be like to be with Him in heaven. Uh, the Holy Spirit is present in the church. Sometimes you can feel His presence. Sometimes you can sense something is not quite right and the Lord we know is here because it said where two or three of you gather in my name, I will always be there. But sometimes we can sense something is quenching the Spirit of God and He doesn't have the freedom to move in our hearts and lives. Sometimes we have tension. Somebody's unhappy about something. And they bring that unhappiness into this room. Well, guess what? We do need to do that because the altar is open for us to come and pray and deal with those issues in our life. But sometimes when we bring that tension or that uh, bit of bitterness or anger into the fellowship with the others, we quench the Spirit of God. If we're not there to deal with that, to deal with what brought that feeling in our life, we quench the Spirit. We need unity. We need to be working together. And we must have freedom for the Spirit to work in our midst and lead our church. The fourth thing he mentions in this section is affection and mercy. We are to care about the people that God brings across our path. There are all kinds of places people can go, but if God brings them here, if God led them through the doors of this place, then he's waiting to see how we will treat them. Will we love on them? Will we show that we care about them? Will we show interest in their lives and what's going on in their lives? Will we show God's mercy? Will we work to help meet their needs? As we learn to do these things, we begin to show unity. Uh, no one should have to force us to love people. It ought to come natural for us as Christians. After all, God loved us even if we were way away from God. And he loved us back into fellowship with him. We need to love the folks that God brings here. It ought to be second nature that we encourage one another in our walk with life. Life is tough. Some of us have it pretty easy. Some of us it's a struggle every day. I think it's important that when we come here, we can find love, acceptance, and encouragement. We're not at the same level spiritually, but we can help one another through this journey of life. Paul says unity, not uniformity. Secondly, he talks about united in love. Paul is writing to a group of believers at a little town called Philippi, and 
Uh, there was a church that he had helped start there. That church had been generous with Paul on a number of occasions. They had taken a love offering and sent it to Paul to help him on his missionary journey wherever the Lord was leading him, starting a new church. Paul mentions in verse 2 that they are to have the same love for each other. Paul is expressing the fact that he loved them, but he wanted them to love each other. We need to love each other. As I said, we won't always agree. But if we can love each other, we can get past the things that we may see differently. Paul had a good relationship with the folks there. Uh, You know, it's easy to form little cliques. I was pastor of a church over in Mooresville, North Carolina, and my family doctor, I invited him to attend church, and he started attending He went to the hospital every Sunday morning about 8 o'clock. His wife came whether he was there or not. She'd come on in and sit in for worship. And oftentimes, in fact, almost every service sat by herself. Now everybody had in mind that the doctor will get here sooner or later and he'll slip in and sit beside his wife. If, if you understand the role of a doctor, when he gets to the hospital, if somebody's not doing well, he forgets about making it to church because he's got to take care of this patient. And so Sunday after Sunday, she sat by herself. Another church invited her to attend. She went one Sunday. The second Sunday, she joined. And I went to the doctor and I said, after a, almost a year attending our church, she goes to the other church and joins after two Sundays. What happened? He said, nobody ever showed her any interest in your church. He said, I don't mean it ugly, but she sat by herself week after week after week. Let me challenge you. If you come into church on Sunday morning and you see somebody sitting by themselves, especially if it's somebody you're not totally familiar with, get out of your little group and go sit with them. Don't let them sit alone. Don't let them be that person that's wishing they had a friend at church and nobody seems to care. I challenged folks in the past to uh, recognize some folks that you've not seen and that may be their member and you just haven't gotten to know them. But... Recognize that that this is a person you don't know and go sit with them so that you build a friendship with them. We form our little cliques and sometimes we sit with the same people every service. We do the same activities. We may be in a small group together or a Sunday school class together and we do things together and we never expand our group to welcome someone new within our fellowship. Paul would challenge us that New people that come in may feel unwanted or unloved. We need to help them come to know our family here as as church family. Paul also refers to sharing the same feelings. Do you know if one member of our church is hurting, in a sense all of us ought to hurt with them. If somebody's struggling because the doctor gave them a bad report last week and they're facing surgery or cancer treatments, we ought to rally around them and love them as a church family should. It may be they're having some difficulties in other areas of their life and we need to rally around them. When they hurt, we we share that hurt. It helps take some of the burden, some of the load away. Guess what? Not everybody's hurting. Sometimes people are celebrating. Something great is happening. And we can celebrate along with them and share the joy and the excitement. Uh, Last night was an exciting time for my wife and I. We we do this right frequent, but last night was special because today is my oldest granddaughter's seventh birthday. And we had mailed them some packages in Florida and uh, they got them. And so last night we were FaceTiming and watching them open their presents and part of it was closed and so... They're running in another room and changing and coming back out and wearing this outfit or that outfit. And and we got to celebrate with them that it was her birthday. And 
you got two granddaughters, you don't just send a present to one. You send it to both. I mean, that's the way grandparents do things. And, and so we got to see both of them sharing the joy of, of that particular moment. Paul reminds us in this passage of Scripture that we're not to do anything out of rivalry or conceit. Consider others, he says, as more important than yourself. Now, I know that's hard to do. Because you look at yourself in the mirror every day and you kind of like what you see. It's kind of hard to value others more than you value yourself. But spiritually we should. Every person is important to God and we need to encourage them and look out for their best interest. I had a lady I was talking to this week. She was at the hospital visiting and she saw this elderly lady come in and look around like she was absolutely lost. And she said four or five employees walked by there. She said, excuse me, excuse me. And they ignored her and went right on out. Some other folks who were also visiting in the hospital, she tried to speak to them and they all ignored her and went all out. And this lady had her daughter with her, so she really didn't have the time. They had gone to get a snack going back to look after her husband. And she said, I just felt bad for that lady. Nobody showing any interest in her. And so I went over to her and she said, I'm here for rehab and I don't have a clue where to go. She had a folder with her. She said, do you mind if I look at your paperwork? And she said, no, I I don't understand it all. And she looked at it and they didn't describe what rehab. Was it for occupational therapy? Was it voice rehab? What do you need? And she says, I don't know, but I've got a phone number here. And she said, well, that phone number is a Cary phone number, not a Raleigh phone number. Are you sure you're at the right hospital? Well, they told me to come here. So she took her upstairs. They were on the ground floor. Took her upstairs to the information desk and asked the folks at the information desk to call that doctor's number, find out exactly what kind of therapy she was there for, and then she went on to her room and left her in the care of somebody that could make a difference. Now, I'm saying all that to say this. Sometimes people come to our church and they've not been to church much. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. Isn't it interesting that we all know where we're going and so we go to church and when we get through in here, we hop up and go to our Sunday school class. Stand outside the door and lock the door and don't let them leave because there are a lot of folks that come to worship that don't stay for Sunday school. It may be. They don't know which class to go to. And so they just choose to go home rather than try to figure it out. Greet them. Help them find a place where they can be involved in Bible study. We can't really lock the door. I I was just saying that facetiously. But, you know, make sure that you're doing what you can to help the folks that you see that come into this place. Do we even recognize people that have a need? Do you see church members who are struggling with something and you can see it in their face that they're really struggling with something and perhaps they just need someone to talk with, someone who can encourage them. Find a way to help. All of us need to show love and concern for other people. Don't wait to be asked. If you need me, call me. You ever said that to somebody? How many times have they called you? Not many, right? Usually they're going to think, well, it's too much of a bother. I'm not going to ask for help. You've got to step out of your comfort zone and go offer to help. And don't just say, call me. I'm here to help. What can I do to make a difference for you right now? Our young people have been working some lately. Two or three different times, I understand, helping some of our elderly people. Now, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Most of them, the elderly didn't call to ask for that help because they didn't want to be a bother to anybody. Now, I know there's some of you as adults who do the same thing. You're always looking for some of our elderly folks to offer to help. But that's the kind of attitude all of us ought to take. Look, and don't wait to be called on. Look and see a need and do something about it. If we can, then we're demonstrating that we are a loving and caring church. Paul says, be united 
in love. Thirdly, not only did he talk about unity, not uniformity, and united in love, but in the third place, he talks about the ultimate goal. Paul mentions at the end of verse 2 that we are to focus on one goal. Now, the church may have several purposes, but one of the key points, one of the key directions for a church is to reach people that need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When a church has been around for some time, it tends to be inward focused, not outward focused. We start wanting things that will take care of a need that we have or something we would like to see have. Uh, some of you have been reading that book and I've been reading it and sharing a little inser- uh, excerpts from it on Wednesday night in our, our study. Uh, Blackaby said that while he was in Canada, a church came up with a sizable amount of money that they were going to send to his ministry. And when it was brought to the congregation, the congregation said, that's too much money to give away. We need it right here. We already have a gym But we'll turn that one into a men's gym and we'll build a new gym so we'll have a women's gym. I'm sitting there scratching my head as I read. What in the world does a church need with two gymnasiums? When there was a great mission opportunity they could help with, but all they did was focus on themselves. That's church. If we're not careful, we can fit that same mold that we stop looking at how we can make a difference in the community or our state or our nation or the world and we only think about ourselves. Now, if you've raised children, you know what I'm fixing to say. Children are born selfish. You busy doing something and they want your attention right now. They don't want to wait 10 minutes. You, you wait a little bit and let me finish this. And I'll, No, no, I want you now. It's kind of like some of us. We just never outgrew it, you know. Uh, we may have the feeling that our opinion is the only one that matters. I've been in some business meetings where that was the attitude of somebody there, I can tell you. Uh, our ego may drive us to seek a certain position because we think That will make us look good to those around us. If we're not careful, we can ignore what God wants just to get our own way. A church may lose priority over sharing the gospel. It doesn't seem to bother us a whole lot when we go week after week after week after week and don't baptize anybody. It's a problem. We need to be a church that is reaching out to lost people, not just entertaining ourselves, but reaching out to folks who need Jesus Christ. Kenley has a lot of churches. In fact, you can go around most any corner and you can find another. Well, I didn't know that one was there, and there it is. Has a lot of churches. I'm a little bit biased, and I've only been here about six months, but I'm a little bit biased. I think everybody in Kenley ought to come to Kenley Missionary Baptist Church. I mean, I'm, you know, I just feel like it's a good place and they all ought to come here. But in reality, there are lots of choices. And if we're not the loving and caring church we should be, they'll go somewhere else. We need to reach out and make a difference in people's lives. God has blessed us with the people and the resources to impact our community for Christ. We need to do more than just focus on ourselves. What can we do to reach Kenley? What can we do to reach our world? Certainly we need to reach our town, but there are many other places that uh, we ought to have the world on our hearts. Uh, Kelton quite often says, our director of missions, that there are numbers of places in Johnston County that are unchurched or underchurched. There's not enough churches to reach the people that live in that area. Kenley may not be one of those. So we may need to think outside of our own local community in how can we help reach people in another area and maybe join with another church to help them in reaching that area. Russ and Mary have introduced us to work in, uh, in Kenya. Great needs. Great needs there. 
Some of you have had the opportunity to go. Listen, don't let it be a one-time experience and then you just forget about it. People are desperate all over the world. Many of them would come to know Christ if an effort was made to reach them. So we need to have the world on our hearts, not just here locally, but how can we make a difference in our, our world that we live in? I don't want to be misunderstood, but you know, I understand we have a Spanish mission. I've not heard anything about it, hardly at all in six months. Now, I believe if that is our mission, that we need to be more involved. We need to help that mission grow stronger, that we could help them do a better job of reaching our community with our Spanish population. Paul closed our scripture by saying we're not to look out for our own interest, but to look out also for the interest of others. If your family is like mine, I've got a number of family members that are lost. I've got a number of, I've tried to witness to and didn't get very far. I've got some others that I've planted some seeds and kind of waiting for right opportunities to, to pursue it a little bit more. We can be callous to the condition of lost people. They're in a predicament. I've had people look at me and say, one of these days I will settle down and I will trust Christ. I was reading obituaries in the paper. I always check every day to make sure my name's not in there. And, and I looked this morning, my name wasn't there, so it's going to be a good day, okay? But I saw an article of a young man... I think he was 27, was killed in a car accident last Monday morning. Suddenly, without warning, gone. And left behind two small children. Sometimes we've got family members that are in that same boat that could be killed in an accident, and we need to get it in our heart and mind that if something happened to them this week, they're going to spend eternity away from God. Paul says we need to be focusing on this ultimate goal. Our friends, our neighbors, our family, they need Jesus Christ. And without him, they're going to be lost forever. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. My brother-in-law was in the hospital this past week and Carolyn went to visit him last Sunday night while I was here for our, our search committee announcement. And when she walked in the door, he says, where's Bobby? Where's Bobby? I need to talk to Bobby. I'm dying. Well, at that moment, he wasn't dying, but in his mind, he was. And he wanted to talk to me because he knows things are not quite the way they ought to be in his life, his relationship with the Lord. I went to see him on Monday. And on Monday, we were talking about it, and I said, uh, what's this talk about I'm dying? He said, yeah, I died yesterday. I said, you died yesterday? He said, yeah. He was a little confused. The medicine they'd given him, given him was too strong. I said, yeah, I died yesterday. I looked around the room and I said, well, if I'm with you in your dying yesterday, I know I'm going to go to heaven and this hospital room doesn't look like heaven to me. So something's wrong in your dream. We need to get back to the reality of it here. And we tried to talk, but he was still so confused, I couldn't get the witness into him that I really need to do. We need to have a sense of urgency that people are lost. They need to accept Jesus before it's too late. Our ultimate goal should be that every person we know, every person we encounter, they need Jesus. And if we'll do our part to make a difference in their life, God will save some. He might not save them all because you have to be willing. But we need to be focused on reaching our friends for Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the challenge you give to us from your word. Help us to be a loving and caring church so that every person who comes this way would, would sense that this is a place where love is found. And because they see it and feel it from us, 
but they want to be a part of this fellowship where they can share the love and spread that love across our community, our state, our world. Lord, help us not to always be focused on self, but to look around us and see people who need Jesus, see places where we can make a difference, some of our elderly members, people in our community, our mission church, somewhere that, Lord, we can plug in and make a difference. Lord, as you speak to our hearts, give us courage to follow you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, that's your greatest need, and I encourage you to come and accept him today. Dario and I will both be here at the front, and we've got others that are here that can help you if you need it, and we'll be glad to share with you how you can invite Christ into your life to know for certain that you are going to go be with God in heaven. Some of you have been thinking about being a part of the fellowship here. As God speaks to your heart, you come. Some of you may have other needs, just want to kneel here at the altar and pray, or if you want one of us to pray with you, we'll be glad to do that as well. As God speaks to your heart, you come this morning. Please rise. How about now? Okay. <clears throat> I told Preacher Bobby before he came up, I said, I'm ready for you to preach. I could feel God's spirit in here this morning and um, felt it in a strong way, in a way I hadn't felt it in a while. Been a, a lot of things going on here, but um, praise God, he's pulled us through it and he's walked with us through every bit of it. Now today, I'm going to ask when I get through speaking, the Kevin and them do this song one more time. I look out in this crowd, and I'll talk about myself first, okay? I've got problems. I've got issues. Um, my wife will tell you, my daughter will tell you, I'm not perfect by any means. I miss my son every day. He's been dead for 11 years now. 
and almost see them in heaven. I see others out here that have their problems too. And I just want to tell you that Jesus Christ is the one that's gotten me through mine, through all the hard times. Um, he's the one that does it. I see people out here that are hurting. I see people that, you know, they're having problems in their marriages. I see people that are sick physically, that have physical ailments. I see people that they want relief. But, you know, this altar is where it's at. We have to leave it at this altar. If you've got burdens today, I challenge you to come up to this altar and let's leave them here today. Let's pray for this church today. I've done all the surveys and all the little tests and everything I ever want to do to hire another preacher. And, um, you know, I think we've done a good job at a lot of things, but I think way too often we forget about the simple solution is Jesus Christ. We all say we don't have time. We don't have time to serve. Let me tell you what, we've got time to do whatever we want to do. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else I'm looking at. I love y'all. You may not believe that, but I do. You may not agree with everything I say. And I'm like Preacher Bobby, I don't agree with about half I say. But I do try to live for Jesus. And I'm trying to live for Jesus, and I'm going to continue. And I'm going to try to be an example for a lot of you in here. A lot of you in here have been an example for me. But I challenge you as we listen to this song. This morning on my, on my way here, you know, I was thinking about my mother. She had surgery this past week. She thought she was going to die, you know. And we went to the room that Friday. After she came out of surgery, she was crying, and she said, I didn't think I'd ever see my boys again. She had that fear. I looked at her and said, well, Mama, you going, you know, you going to see us again. We're all going to be in heaven. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that my family's there, part of my family's there waiting. I want everybody else to be there. I want KMBC to make a difference. I want new members that are a part of this group. God, I want to see them grow and, and help us here. But let's do it with the help of Jesus Christ. We can't do it through through our education or through our minds. We've got to do it through Christ. And um, I love y'all. I pray that when you listen to this song right now, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to thank God for everything I have. I'm going to thank him for my wife, my daughter. I'm going to thank him for each one of y'all. And um, I love you. And if you would, play the song over and Y'all really think about, have you accepted Christ? Have you given him all your problems? I feel different today. I feel good. I feel, whoa, I feel relieved for the first time in months sitting in here at the spirit that's in here. So thank y'all, and if you would.
challenge us to in our days ahead lead us to reach out to those who are in need reach out to our families those who are closest to one another forgive those small things that are preventing us from being able to do those things heavenly father we thank you for your blessings and your working in our church committee dear lord i am personally humbled and just amazed by how you have completely made that a possibility all these things we ask in your name amen amen 